be happening. <laughs> you know? But that's that's an interesting facet of this, right? I mean, yeah. PKD's writing all of these years before his Valis experience, and then he looks back and he goes, I was kind of writing something that would happen to me. Did, did I write that into my existence? Well, What's yeah. going on here with reality, but, you know? But that's what's so interesting, right? I mean, he eventually realizes that he's not separable from his writing. Mm -hmm. And that he's not rewriting himself in some sense where he's the director. And he's deciding, okay, I'm going to be like this now. But the act of writing itself and whatever occurs in the act of writing rewrites him. Mm. And in rewriting him, it puts him into this place where gnosis occurs. And that maybe gnosis is this act of rewriting oneself, right? Not with any particular content, just the act of rewriting oneself. And you don't have to decide what you're going to rewrite yourself with. You just have to open yourself to the fact that all these things that you thought were descriptive and kind of referring to some world out there are actually mantra that you're using on yourself. And in using them on yourself, you, you affect and alter the so-called out there. That doesn't mean you, you have control over the so-called out there, but you are involved in the production of the out there. And that's kind of what Trump is. Trump is the collective production of this idea that there's some sort of external reality that has these characteristics and we don't like them, right? Mm. So it's that, <laughs> you know, it's that problem of pushing it away, I think, that is the issue and say, okay, welcome. Like, I, think, I think we should invite Trump to the show. We should invite Trump and ask him if it's true that he's buster friendly. <laughs> just just call him out on it <laughs> just say Are no we're, like, we're doing we're investigative journalists we're not fake news we're not associated with any kind of broadcast network we like we don't make any money i'm sorry <laughs> you know um, but we'd like to know uh, is it the case we've heard that you're buster friendly meaning that you broadcast 25 hours a day and that you know, your interest is uh, competing in our attentional economy, uh, which is where we're going to start, actually, the competition between Buster Friendly and Mercer. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> are we done we, yet? We are we are ready to go. <laughs> um, I just pressed the, the live stream button. So we've started Good. in the midst of this Good. talking. About started. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, welcome, everybody, to our third session. And uh, so session three, we are supposed to have read the three stigmata of Palmer Eldritch. Uh, we've got some slides today as well. And I just want to remind everybody that um, there is a class portal. So if you miss any of our classes, not only are they on our Facebook page, Neuro Learning, but they're also on the class portal. When you sign up, when you give us your email, we, we send that to you every week. So definitely check the downloads tab. All of the sessions are, are there. Um, and on top of that, yeah, I just want to thank everybody who's donated so far and encourage you to keep donating, helping us keep the lights on. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, are the slides available, Catherine's saying? Yeah, we could probably upload those too. Um, I'll do that if, if you're okay with that, Rich. Yeah, for sure. Great. I'm going to make a note to do that okay. for everybody. In fact, make some new ones and put them on there and make it look like they're better. <laughs> I could do that very easily. <laughs> um, but I kind of like the organic feel, the, the photographs, the, the yeah. etching. Me too. You know, moment of, of like making that connection is kind yes. of energy there but um yeah okay rich uh, i'm gonna mute myself and and you can take it away for us so thanks for joining us for week three thanks jeremy and i really hope you'll um you know interrupt and dialogue like the way we've been doing so far because that's really been to me one of the pleasures of this is this kind of dialogue that is emerging between us that we always do like right before the webinar and which continues in kind of phone calls sometimes during the week and uh that that's a really precious thing because i i always go back to this and i don't even know anymore if he really said it but i'm pretty sure he did that terence we kind of said find the others a and this kind of remarkable energy that you can get when you find somebody else and a group of other people that you can be in dialogue with that if you can just sort of feel what an unbelievable gift that is when you know we really are living our all living in our own worlds together right in the sense that we really do all have this very uh 
private cosmos that we live in based on all the signs and ways in which we sense the world quite differently, right? The possible set of combinations by which a human subject could experience the world, you know, is not infinite, but it's so enormous that it dwarfs any kind of number of human beings that will ever have been around. So when you say, oh, like, I know what you're saying, <laughs> you know, like, or word, <laughs> you know, that that's a really beautiful moment because it shows us that we can at once respect the total uniqueness of those experiences that we're all having. Uh, and at the same time say, Hey, you know, not only is there overlap, but all those experiences are actually pointing to the same phenomenon. They're, they're pointing to that, which uh, is beyond all of us and is bringing all of us into uh, being and which PKD, you know, ends up calling Vallis, but that's, sort of where we're heading, the vast active living intelligence system, not as a real entity that is external to ourselves, but as the practice of discovering the interconnection that we already experience, right? That is already true. And that, and that Dick was coming up with fictional strategies to uh, point us to something that he was feeling, which is the way in which we were all, like it was becoming obvious that we were all interconnected in these ways as he started to imagine the universe as being made primarily as inf of information rather than matter, right? Which was one of his big insights really. So once we're all connected unmistakably in a matrix of information, then the report of our senses that were somehow separate from each other as distinct material beings becomes increasingly difficult to sort of sustain. And, and that's where we're living right now, where the image of the, our separation is in increasingly difficult to sustain, but people try very hard to sustain it. So one of the things I'm very excited about that we're all doing together is that we're performing this radical act of reading, which is actually an extraordinary act right now, because what we're in the midst of is very similar to what we finished with last time from Dr. Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, where um, we had the, uh, more or less the competition between Buster Friendly and Mercer for the mind space of the humans that were left, you know, on, or on Terra. And that it's this, again, the insight is remarkable once we slow down and we see PKD, is that he saw that the fundamental competition is not over really resources or materials, but over attention. And that he did this at a time when that was not nearly as obvious as it is today. That, you know, what the, the battle that is going on in terms of the contemporary planet is the battle for attention. That all the, you know, that, that it's a storyscape in which we are meant to become enthralled with this story rather than that story. And usually it's a story that has something to do with what's going on out there. And what's interesting though, is that the story both of Mercer and of our experience of reading Dick's novels together is the story that's also at least very much about what's in here, right? That the experience of empathy that Mercer was asking, hoax or no, fiction writer or no, right? That was asking us to participate in, right? Is itself not fictional, right? In other words, the means may be fictional, but the, the ask and the accomplishment is real. And, and the, the real empathy that it can occur when we engage in this radical act of reading is remarkable because what we're doing is we're engaging what I like to call the general strike against the attentional economy, right? The attentional economy would maximize the amount of time that we spend on Facebook or any other domain where our data can be commodified, can be monetized, and where our, our attention, therefore, can be monetized. And so when we engage in the act of reading, simply by virtue of the platform that it's on, basically, and I think this is crucial, the form of attention that is necessary to it, right? The actual sense of reading a book in, a, in one week means that there's a certain point where you need to fall into that book. You cannot simply kind of carve out chunks of it and say, okay, I'm gonna read 50 pages now, 
you know, <laughs> I'm going to carve off this part. It's like, no. Okay. You've taken the candy. It was intravenous. You thought that you were avoiding it. And the next thing you know, it's a one, you know, it's, it's one way, it's a one way trap. It's a one way flow, right? You're in it. And, and, and when you're in it, when you're in Eldritch, when you're in the world of the three Sigma of Tomer Eldritch, you're not in either the world of Buster Friendly or Mercer, right? You're in this world where it becomes apparent to you that we can perturb reality for you wholesale. In other words, that your attentional experience is itself so deeply commodified and so deeply the result of being enthralled with some story, whether it's a drug or it's a media medium, some story that you're supposed to be enthralled with and you can't get away from it, right? That's the sense in which, as we were saying beforehand, that, you know, Trump is eldritch, right? You know, that it, it, it's, he just won't go away, right? We, we, we can let other people articulate what the three stigmata of Palmer Trump, you know, are. But, and, that's, and that's not to demonize him, because what I think is so beautiful about what PKD does with Palmer Eldritch is the sympathy and compassion that he shows for Eldritch. Eldritch is not simply, you know, a Luciferian character in the usual sense, right? That he recognizes that it's just this deep need for it to propagate itself that is beyond good and evil, that allows us, allows us to even have, a, I think, and be interested to hear what people have to say, a certain sympathy for Eldritch. Right? So um, that's just a way of starting and saying like, yeah, we're engaging in this thing together. We're engaging, and we're, we're engaging in a radical experiment actually, which is what does it mean to read for a week? And what does that have to do with ultra metacognition? And what's very interesting is that to me, the Three Sigma of Palmer and Eldritch is the most like this of any of PK to books, just in my experience. That you find yourself reading the book and you become something like alarmed at your own response to the book. That there's a part of you that responds to the book and it's not in your control. You suddenly stopped being a reader and started being a hovelist, as it were. You know, you're, you're a participant. Remember, everybody has to participate in the fantasy. And somehow you're a participant in the fantasy just as much as, you know, Sam Regan and Fran are a participant in the fantasy. And you're suddenly a participant in this book. And the usual boundary, this is how I experience it, the usual boundary between the book and the reader dissolves, right? And in that dissolution, um, you can find yourself a little bit alarmed because you don't know where the boundary is. Like, so you start seeing, like, you might not see the three stigmata of Palmer Eldritch in terms of the Jensen Lugsvid eyes, right? You know, or the, uh, the arm, right? Or the jaw, the teeth, right? But you start to see an Eldritchian aspect, <laughs> of the universe, <laughs> you start to see Eldritch in all things. And you start to see in particular, this idea that your awareness, your consciousness is captured by something. And you're caught up in an awareness of something and you're caught up in a consciousness of something over which you don't seem to have any control. Just as, you know, Leo Bolero does not really have control over you know the world that he finds himself in with Eldritch, or Barney Meyerson does not find himself in control when he you know heads back to reenact his karmic drama with Emily, but then it turns out you know Eldritch is everywhere. That this sense of a lack of control puts us into disarray, and that can, is precious when it comes to ultra metacognition for the following reason: one is it is that when we see ourselves falling into the kind of into the novel as also happens in Ubik, I think we become observers on our own experience of reading. We're observing the effects of reading on ourselves. And when we're doing that, 
we have the opportunity to look back and say, hey, wow, how is it that I'm both reading this novel, having this novel affect me in this way, and observing the way the novel affects me in this way? Like, how do I know that the novel, like, why aren't I just simply swallowed up in the novel? And that is an instance of ultra metacognition. So if we can learn to practice that and sort of be with that, and we say, oh, hey, wow, how does it do that, right? How does, how does PKD's text, these sequence of words, put me in this position where I'm both reading something and I'm observing the effect of that reading on me because I'm forced to, because I am alarmed at the effects of this reading on me, right? And that's what I, you know, I hope we can start to kind of begin to focus in on some strategies about how that works, because I think it gives us uh, insight into how we can program and metaprogram our own metacognition, right? And ultra metacognition. And, and that, you know, eventually this is precisely what PK doing, PKD is doing in the exegesis. He's reflecting on the fact that he's written, as we discussed before the webinar, that he's written himself into an existence. He seems to have written himself into a novel. And that like freaks him out, right? Because how, how did I write myself into somebody else's novel? He even says at a certain point, how did I write myself into the world of Ubik? And so in that being freaked out, you know, in that kind of, he, he then is able to reflect, he takes that space to reflect and say, how is it this occurs? So I, I hope we might, uh, be able to isolate a few of those uh, places uh, to see how, how does that work. But part of the way in which it works is simply the fact that by engaging in this radical act of reading right now, it pl plunges us into essentially what, what is a trance, right? Akin to the translational trance of, of Candy or Chuzi. And I think it's really interesting that PKD uses this word translation because, of course, that is what we're all doing with his work. We're taking this sequence of words and we're translating it into our own awareness. Uh, and, and when we do that, we're, uh, first of all, again, just to point to it, we're not participating in the Buster Friendly show. We're not participating in the Mercer show right? But we're participating in something other. And in doing that, we're more or less, uh, I think it's worth experimenting with, we're more or less hosting these worlds. In other words, we're acting hospitable to these worlds. Like we agree to allow these worlds come into a, to fruition, co you know, cognitively, metacognitively, and ultra-metacognitively, in order to explore them. Because of course, without awareness, without the consciousness of the Havilists, neither the Candy or the Chuzi does anything. And without the uh, consciousness, awareness of the readers, PKD's works are in the same boat, right? That, they, that, that, that they're, they're not actually being brought into existence. They're just sitting there as I think what he calls elsewhere, kind of the, the homoplasmate, right? You know, that, 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 that it's waiting to be kindled, but we're, we're not actually bringing it to life. And when we engage in this radical act of reading of agreeing to fall in a rather long-term trance with these words, then we are doing so as a, almost as a way of welcoming, hosting the world he's asking us to imagine and, and inhabit. So he, he's sharing a world with us across time whose existence is contingent on our participation. And so we want to participate. And so th this, this act of reading I think is really um, something that was being pointed to by PKD. And, you know, and, you know, the simple proof I would ask, I, I would give for that is why else did he write books? <laughs> right. <laughs> except, 
for us to fall in these trances of experiencing these worlds that he's bringing into being and agreeing to be a host of this world. And when we do that, it can feel uncanny. It can feel like there's, remember, even the uh, chicken pox prospects hovelists say, there's a presence there, right? And, and I think that that also describes the Phil Dickian effect of reading Three Stigmata or, or Ubik, which I guess we'll be doing next week in particular, that you feel like, you know, Pink Floyd, there's something in my head and it's not me. You know, there, you feel like something else has shown up if you really fall into the trance. And not everybody likes that. And they don't like it because it puts the idea that we're in control of the reading experience or from PKD's perspective that he is in control of the writing experience into disarray, right? So radical act of reading, um, we're engaging in a general strike on the attention economy when we do this. And that the good news is that what we can discover when we fall into this kind of trance, when we, when we allow ourselves to host these worlds, that um, if we'll engage in this, it's an attentional discipline. I mean, I'd be interested in hearing from people, you know, because people are different on different places on the continuum of how, like how much they enjoy falling into long, long-term rapid reading. Uh, and, you know, in terms of how much attentional discipline it takes to actually do this, you know, as a, you know, as a professor who teaches literature and philosophy and rhetoric, I have observed that the attentional capacity of students to deal with these long-term trances of highly focused attention on long sequences of text is dwindling radically. And that shouldn't surprise us, right? Like if you train for a marathon and then you stop and you start only running a mile every now and then, you know, if you went and tried to run a marathon again, or you went to try to run 10 miles again, it would be very difficult. And the kind of attentional practice that most of us are engaged in most of the time is very much short bursts of attentional, you know, uh, discipline. And, and, and that's high, highly scattered and organized by whatever the market is throwing at us. So uh, we might think about it as a kind of, you know, really, you know, deeply radical strategy um, in which we're engaging in a general strike against the attentional economy, but also that when we do that, we see something very significant, which is that it's possible. In other words, that it's possible to uh, abide in this domain where we're actually exercising our attention you know, in a highly focused manner for long periods of time on things that don't bring us money, right? <laughs> and that, you know, to quote, you know, somebody once upon a time, and that's okay, right? And that's actually a deep part of who we are, that we've, that as, you know, human beings, we've spent a long part of our, you know, evolutionary history engaged in acts of deep attention on narrative in particular, right? Whether it's in a fire circle or in a novel, we've been engaged in this kind of deep attentional strategy around narrative in order to make sense of who and what we are. And now we're going through some kind of a mutation in that. And the only way we can deal with that mutation properly is by being able to have something to compare to. And when we can dive deep into our uh, attentional uh, practice and experience a bit of, uh, you know, ultra metacognition, you know, then we're in the position where maybe it's as if we've written, you know, this post-it note, it's not a post-it note, but it's a post-it note that Sam Regan writes to himself on the mirror. And he says, hey, you're Sam Regan. <laughs> You've just taken candy. Make the most of this, you know, right? That's an act of ultra, metacognition and we can do that to ourselves too we can say hey most of the time we're freely giving our attention to things that are telling us that they're extremely important and they have nothing to do 
with our own experience of self. Why are we selling? Why are we giving away? Why are we enthralled to, you know, a, a commodity framework for attention when we don't even know who we are, right? <laughs> we, we, we have, we, like, why not use that attentional capital, if you will, right? And say, hey, you know, where's all this coming from? You know, what is this experience that I'm having? What are its characteristics? Not what is its content? What can I fill it with next? But really, what, what is this like to be here on Terra? Which, of course, you'll remember, is exactly where Palmer Eldritch loops around to eventually in his attempt to substitute himself for Barney. He just wants to live as a hovelist, you know, on Mars so that he can just enjoy everyday life and more or less be in the now. Um, and so, uh, you know, this Eldritchian experience we have can remind us saying like, hey, how about I learn how to practice focusing my attention on present moment the same way I was able to practice my attention on the narrative uh, structure uh, or the, the, the trance, let's say, the experience of the Three Sigmata of Palmer Eldritch. So because, you know, in that sense, you know, then we start to understand the weird, you know, the, the assonance, the rhyming between hovelist and novelist, you know, that we're, we're being invited into this, to participate in this group experiment. But we're all, you know, we're all taking the same drug. We're all watching the same show. And when we do that, we're not, you know, we have the op opportunity to, like Sam Reagan, participate in some uh, ultra metacognition. So, I mean, I thought that was a good way to start because I, I thought it was important something to say about, um, at least for me, the experiential aspect of reading uh, Three Sukhmata in particular, each time, and this time was no exception, I read it. And there's that point where I lose control. And, and, and what I thought the book was about is not what it's about. And I need to observe my own experience with it. And what we'll do is we'll look at a couple of pages and look and see like how that might work uh, there on our experience. But that's what I wanted to sort of open with and see if there are any questions or comments after that. Yeah, so <clears throat> everybody feel free to, to chime in. I know everyone has been chiming in as we've been going along. Um, Maybe we can take a, just a few initial questions here about the book. Okay, so from Lindsay, she was mentioning, she was just commenting, um, been wondering why people translate into duality, men into men, women into women, when it came to the Candy and, and Perky Pat and uh, Walt Essex. Why does Lindsay think, that, think so? Good question, Lindsay. <laughs> Feel free to chime in in the chat. <laughs> she says, um, it seems they need an androgynous character for the metacognition to really be had. It's interesting. Well, hmm. see, I, I would put it this way, um, is that, because um, I, I think it's always fascinating to track uh, sort of uh, the gender persona that PKT is traveling with, because he's kind of both he, he, he seems to me to be fearless in this regard. In fact, a lot of critics have been unkind to him. Uh, and Catherine Hales wrote about, you know, some of the uh, gender biases in his work. But I, I think it's because um, PKD is addressing many people where they were in 1968, 1960s. And even, frankly, you know, sadly, today, that he's addressing people and periodically himself as dualists, right? In other words, the problem is not that we live in a world of monists, right? You know, the problem is that we live in a world of dualists who actually think that there are such things as men which are opposed to women, which are somehow binarily distinct from women and women that are somehow binarily distinct from men. And they, would, and they even have the audacity to point to you know, scriptural traditions and claim that those scriptural traditions authorize that idea 
that male and female are somehow opposed or distinct characteristics when even in the uh, book of Genesis, especially in the book of Genesis, in, you know, the Hebrew Bible, that in fact, you know, Ish and Isha, man and woman respectively, are nested within each other and that Isha is actually named first in uh, the Old Testament, so-called in the book of Genesis, and that Ish is actually named second and that both of them come from Ha-Adam, which is the gender neutral character uh, who was given birth to first um, before there is anything male or anything female. So I think, you know, we live in such a dualistic world, meaning that, you know, filled with beings that identify as dualists, that even when they're faced with a deeply uh, monistic and uh, interconnected text, they, such as Genesis, they turn it into scripture that somehow licenses the dominion of one gender over another or the opposition of one gender to another, rather than seeing them as aspects of being human, of being ha-adam, and that aspects which we share whatever like, sort of genitals that we have. Um, I'm not sure that giving an androgynous character would do that. You know, I think that, in fact, g making that an androgynous, androgynous character would make us think that we had done that. But in order to really um, feel our kinship with each other and to feel the fact that uh, the separation that we sometimes perceive in a kind of dualistically oriented reality is just a perception, we have to, in fact, see that what appear as opposites are deeply interconnected and are not opposites at all. Um, now, of course, once we do that, we start to see that, you know, all objects, forms, processes, you know, experiences have mass male and female aspects to them and that those are not characteristics of individual bodies any more than, you know, like orange or, you know, spicy or, <laughs> Uh, attributes of inter individual bodies. There are qualities that are, uh, uh, are present in the world. And then our dualistic framework of reality where most of us live sort of articulates those things as if they were real. And what I think that uh, is never a danger in PKD is for us to think that, that he is suggesting at any point in time that appearance is reality, right? That, that the appearances are not real. Now, of course, does Sam Reagan think that appearances are reality? Absolutely. Does, does Fran Schein sometimes think that appearances are reality? Absolutely. That's because that's, we're, we're, we're talking about characters who are dualists. We're talking about uh, most readers who are dualists. Uh, but then being introduced to experiences that refuse to be confined by these kind of categories, that's when we begin to question the reality of the dualism, it seems to me. Um, but, you know, uh, I think uh, a, a, a counter argument is to be found in the remarkable uh, book by Joanna Rus, The Female Man, uh, which uh, she published first under a male uh, um, name because of the difficulties of uh, uh, publishing in, uh, you know, in science fiction at the time. But it's a really remarkable book and uh, sort of in many ways the, the, the equal experimentally and ultra metacognitively uh, of, of, of Dick's works. Um, and there, you know, you have an experiment uh, that, that is a little bit different. But uh, again, I think it's, it's interesting that, you know, Dick, PKD is speaking to us where we are, you know, as, as opposed to where we should be. Yeah, there's some great um, feedback in the chat about this question. Uh, Tessa was mentioning that, you know, it, just writing about that in the in the 60s was kind of breaking a taboo. Yes. But then, and she also mentions, and, and I was thinking of this too, that Ursula K. Le Guin in 1969 came out with Left Hand of Darkness. So that yeah. was kind of something that she was pioneering and breaking through into the, in the 70s. And, so, um, yeah. No, and a beautiful book. And then as I'm sure Tessa well, well knows better than anyone, 
the letters then between PKD and Ursula Le Guin, many of which are found in the uh, exegesis, then become a very interesting dialogue, you know, on that on that topic. Um, so, but you know, interesting question, Lindsay. I think, uh, you know, I, I just think that in the present moment, we somehow feel confident that if we have a new category for something, that we've achieved something, and I, and I'm not sure that we have. Yes. So, let me get another question that spoke to what we were talking about. So Carrie on Facebook is saying, in my case, what does it mean to read for a day? Because I reread it all today yes. and reading it in a shorter space of time really seemed to intensify my yes. experience of it. I might try reading, rereading his other books like that on the basis of this intensification. I, I totally agree. And uh, congratulations on that. I, I think it's great when you can get a day and just do that. Um, it's almost like a retreat. I think it's it's time for us to start thinking about reading as a as a form of refuge, you know, as a form of retreat that we're you know engaging in practice when we do this. And um, you know what I was saying before is that at that moment when we can no longer just start you know read chunks of it, you know we read a segment of it and then we stop and we have to do something else. When it no longer becomes possible to do that that's where it really takes on the intensification. And so, it, you know, set and setting, right? If we set up an experience as if reading the Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch is a trip, which it is, and we say, okay, I'm going to take the day, I'm going to eat some breakfast, I'm going to drink plenty of water, you know, maybe I'll fast the day before, and then I'm going to drop Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, and I'm going to start reading it and I'm going to give the whole day to it. And I'm going to do it in a place where I can't be interrupted. And I'm going to, you know, give myself comfortable things to be around and so forth that I think as your experience happened today, Carrie, that we can be amazed because then we actually intensify the experience and we don't muddle it or dilute it with the things that we think are real or important or otherwise, you know, uh, uh, calling on our attention. And so what I think you've done, Carrie, is that you've hosted it, as I was saying before. You actually set up a place for it. Maybe it was, you know, not by design. It doesn't matter. You're sort of forced into this trance experience, which I think is really fundamental to it. And I think is actually increasingly rare, uh, 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 you know, as, as we go across the generations that people have this trance reading experience. Um, so, you know, well done, and I, I agree. And, and and it's not like you have to rush through it. It's not a, it's not a rushing thing. But just giving yourself totally to it, carving out space for it, and uh, really falling into it. Uh, it again, I I think you're going to get much more out of it. Whereas you know, some people can you know, I don't know, take a hundred micrograms of LSD and they just go dancing. And that can be a beautiful thing. But if you take that 100 micrograms of LSD and you, uh, you know, create the context, the setting in which you can really uh, explore the spaces that it introduces you to, then it's a different kind of experience. Just as, you know, reading in chunks on the train to and from work is a different kind of experience than taking a day and saying, wow, I'm just really going to read this first stigmata of Palmer Elders today and see what, I, you know, how I can be transformed by it. So I think intensification really occurs and that's the sign that it's actually a practice, right? It's not just in the book, it's how you do it. Yeah, this is, this is great. And I would, I would just resonate with what Carrie is saying too, uh, having read this over the past three days very intensively, not in one day, but I'm not that fast of a reader. Um, you know, there's just, a kind of uh, figure ground reversal starts to happen yes. where reality becomes the book um, and the book becomes reality and you just sort of get immersed. And this happened a little bit more just as an observation yeah. uh, with Ubik than yes. Eldritch, but it was still kind of in my mind. And I don't know about you, but as a writer, um, 
reading this so intensely, there's something about, here's another question too that ties into the question I'm going to read it in a moment, uh, but because it links up here, but there's something about when you're a writer and you're reading somebody like Philip K. Dick, whose style and voice become so prominent in your head, in your mind's minds of uh, reading narration in your monologue uh, yes. that I started to kind of narrate what I was doing in real life. Like how would PKD describe this moment of me standing in the kitchen, thinking about this and getting a little weirded out about Eldritch and thinking of his creepy claw hand. And, yes. and but then just sort of, this inner voice started to go, okay, here's how it, here's how you would write yourself in a scene in the, in the novel. So that I just started kind of. <laughs> no, and, and, and no yeah. I, I swear when, when I've taught this in classroom classes, we always talked about making bracelets that said WWPKDD. What would PKD do? <laughs> like a, a la the, what would Jesus do things? Not because he's the Messiah, but because it asks, it, like, as you're quite right, there's something incredibly contagious about the, the, the voice and the style that comes and occupies whatever internal monologue you have. And so your internal monologue becomes Phil Dickian, right? Uh, and so, again, great practice, because what that does is makes you aware of your inner monologue in a way that you are not always aware of, because most of the time, we just identify with our inner monologue. We say, oh, that's me, right? But as I like to say all the time, that's no more you than a headache is. You have a headache. You have an internal monologue. Why is one more you than the other? Answer is neither is. And so when you start to hear your internal monologue, and I agree, I, it's really well put, Jeremy, that your internal monologue starts to take on this Phil Dickian voice. And then when you put it that way, the strategies of Ubik, of having the commercial in between chapters is brilliant because that is the internal monologue of the book. And you start to inhabit that, like you identify with like the use only where directed, <laughs> you know, only as directed. Um, and so I, I, I really think you're onto something is that there's something about PKD's uh, writing which taps into our internal dialogue monologue in a way that maybe Burroughs also does for me in certain ways, but uh, few other writers are really able to achieve, I think. Right. So Dan mentioned this, a very similar point about this. He says, uh, it seems that like PKD uses free indirect discourse very liberally, again, yeah. as a way of breaking down the boundaries between the reader and the characters. Yes. I could probably say this about all three books, Android, Stigmata, and Ubik. Yeah. <clears throat> and and for me also, it's sort of a lot of us who are interested in these kind of, especially in this book, the theological questions, yes. the, the kind of monologues of the characters as they're working out these like spiritual insights about about can, candy and and chewy choosy and theology and the sac like the sacrament all of those things the characters are working out problem translation right thank you they're working out problems and you're working it out with them so you're just you're very susceptible to where the ideas lead and it kind of just puts you in that place where you are you are becoming you it is a kind of translation with you and the characters take this book it is my body <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, I mean, because like, what you're describing is, is is so interesting. Because, of course, the the, the 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 you know the horrifying slogan of Eldridge is "God promises immortality." You know, we deliver it. Is you know, in a way, and this is going to be very controversial, but the New Testament promises communion. You know, but this delivers it. You know, this isn't the only thing that delivers it. But when you start doing that, when you're working out, as you say, Jeremy, these the when you're struggling with these theological issues along with the characters and you're participating in it, right? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am, right? You know, like that you're participating in really what I think was actually described in, in, in the New Testament as communion, which is not communion uh, in, in this kind of classic theological sense. But this moment of experiencing yourself as not being distinct from these characters. It's like, wow, you know, I can love my enemy as myself precisely when I lose that apparent boundary 
between myself and another. And a character is just as much an other to us as a human being, right? They're like to our brain, there's no difference. And so when we learn to dissolve that boundary between ourselves and our and, and, and some ca- other character through this participation in these theological questions that we somehow feel at stake in, right? We don't, they're not just abstract conceptual questions. We feel like, I, you know, what does he mean by that, <laughs> right? We, we, we want to know, like, in what way is that a mystery, right? That how something could be translated. And so, when, and when we do that, when we ponder that, we're actually, in a very interesting way, participating in this other world precisely in the way that Candy, for example, is having people participate in a fictional world. We're participating. And he's staging for us how to participate in a fictional world, but he points to the fact that that fictional world is not satisfying, right? Even like one of the mysteries of the book for me is, why do they give up Candy so suddenly? You know, like they're, they're such aficionados and they're all like, what? There's a new one? Okay. But part of it is they already had lost, remember, they were already just bickering among each other, trying to you know decide what to do next. They were already dissatisfied with it. So this um, this collective participation is you know the, I think a mundane practical interpretation of communion. In fact, that, that that that's what we're doing when we read these books together through the very free and directly put. Yeah. yeah. I, d- I don't want to interrupt anymore. Maybe we can, we can switch over if you'd like to tackle your, your topics um, yeah. for the slides today, yeah. and then yeah. we'll hop back to questions towards Perfect. the end, if that's good. Perfect. Yep. Excellent. Great. So if I get the, uh, just the scrawled one first. Yeah, there you go. The scrawl. And, and I just want to give this as almost this like a seismic, seismographic readout you know, of like, you know, my book is covered in uh, notes, all, all the different copies I have of this are covered in notes. And I really highly recommend this uh, practice of interacting with the book in this way. And, you know, you can do it on Kindle as well. You just, you know, Kindle is wonderful for taking notes and highlighting and making notes. But for me, there's, there's something about the experience that just makes me want to kind of like make marks on a piece of paper so uh, I wanted to share that as sort of part of the, the practice. And the, the marks on the piece of paper don't really need to be descriptive. They're just more kind of readout uh, from the experience. And one of the readouts of the experiences you know, that I have at the, ty- the title at the top here is Ultra Metacognition is Within You, The Telepathic Jackal and the Accidental Perception of Essence. So. Um, the idea of ultra metacognition being within you is, of course, riffing off of, you know, uh, um, uh, um, uh, reson- tr- resonating with Luke 17, 21 uh, in the New Testament, which is not, you know, I'm not offering, you know, as a kind of Christian testimony, but as a, uh, a pointer of how to read, because when Jesus is asked where the kingdom of heaven is, he says, they will not say low it is here or low it is there. The kingdom of heaven is within you. And that sense of like actually, you know, not being anywhere else, but in your own awareness, I think is really crucial to uh, this experience of ultra metacognition because it's this solicitation towards this invitation towards looking at where your own awareness uh, comes from that I think that is a pretty serious strand in PKD's novels uh, and something I think that is worth practicing, as we've said in previous classes. Um, now, the telepathic jackal, of course, is one of my favorite creatures that I've ever cr- come across in, in fiction. Uh, and uh, you'll recall that it occurs at the end of the book. And it, I think it looks, it, it said it looks like a wizened old grandmother down on all fours. Uh, and it's stalking uh, Barney Marison, Parison, Larison. Uh, you remember the the character who whose name is pronounced incorrectly by everyone, and maybe we'll return to that. Uh, and 
you know, Barney Marison is, is done in and the telepathic Jack was, is more or less stalking him. And of course the, uh, the sand dredge as he, as he has an inkling comes to a you know, stop and he has to come down onto the sand dredge and the telepathic Jackal, I believe if I remember correctly, dashes at him. The verb is dash, dashes at him. But then, you know, some feet away, maybe 15 feet away, it rears back, you know, squealing and in an involuntary way, you know, betrays in its mind that, you know, this is unclean, you know, unclean and comes up uh, against it and uh, and comes up short. And uh, what I wanted to uh, point to there is this idea that um, this feeling of being unclean and this feeling of something being wrong with us is also something I think that PKD is pointing to and not in an uh, un, you know not, not a, in an unambivalent way. I mean, I think sometimes it seems to be as if the text feels like there is there is something wrong with us, like that we're doomed to repeat this uh, error of um, you know eating the fruit. You know that eating the that eating choosy was a repetition of you know quote unquote eating the apple, as is said in the book. Even though, of course, if we look at Genesis, which I mentioned earlier, it's not an apple; it's just a fruit. Um, from the garden of the tree, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So um, this idea of uh, there being something wrong with us, sometimes it seems to be PKD comes into this perspective that, yeah, there, there, there's something deep, deeply wrong with us and we kind of need to get good with that. You know, that there's, uh, but at, at other times, it seems to me he's pointing to the fact that uh, what is wrong with us is a kind of scam of uh, our uh, inner dialogue. And uh, what I would point to there, and maybe what I'll speak to right now, is this uh, idea um, of the I itself. Thank you. Thank you, Violet. My daughter just brought me some tea. Thank you, Violet. Uh, of the I itself as being the real infection. That, of course, Palmer Eldritch can only get into us or some sort of presence can only get into us as a real infection. So in the, um, uh, in, in the uh, four novels of the 1960s volume, this is on uh, page, uh, starts off on page 326, but I'll tell you what the chapter is and so forth so that you can either look at it now or uh, look at it later. So here we go, 325, 326. Um, yeah, and this is, this is really, um, yeah, this just right in here, uh, it's, if you look at, um, under, um, eye infection 326 and 389, um, that, you know, to me, it's a really interesting turn in the narrative when, uh, uh, you know, Leo Bolero makes it back and he confronts Barney Marison and he says, uh, he says, the door to Barney Marison's inner office is chapter seven, beginning of chapter seven. So easy for you to find if you have another volume. The door to Barney Marison's inner office flung open, revealed Leo Bolero, hunched with weariness, travel stained. You didn't try to help me. After an interval, Barney answered, that's correct. There was no use trying to explain why, not because Leo would fail to understand or believe, but because of the reason itself. It was simply not adequate. Leo said, you're fired, Meyerson. Okay, and he thought, anyhow, I'm alive. Because you'll recall that when he experienced precognitive, his precognitive faculties about it, it wasn't clear that he would be alive. And if I'd gone after Leo, I wouldn't be now. He began with numbed fingers, gathering up his personal articles from his desk, dropping them into an empty sample case. Um, now, further on down, he said, I looked ahead. It would have cost me too much, my life. In other words, why didn't Barney come and save or help out Leo. And he says, he basically he's saying he made the calculation. The calculation was too extraordinary and it wasn't in his self-interest. So he didn't do it. it, would have cost him too much. But you didn't have to come personally. This is a big company. You could have arranged for a party from here and stayed behind, right? It was true. And he had, hadn't even considered it. Now this to me, I think is a really, excuse me, really interesting moment uh, of the narrative because 
because he Barney Marison has not considered the possibility of going and rescuing Leo Bolero, he assumes that there's something deeply wrong with him, right? In other words, that his uh, that there's something wrong with him for have not considered that. Whereas it's completely possible simply that he didn't consider it. He's not the strategist that Bolero is. He, Bolero asks him, you know, he's called upon basically to go and rescue Bolero and he doesn't do it. And what does he feel in response? He feels guilt. And he feels guilt that he then wants to atone for. And what becomes interesting about that is that, that, that in order to feel that guilt, it seems to me that Barney Marison needs to invent a fictional character who had considered that he could have sent, you know, the, the other members of the organization in order to save Leo Bolero. But at this point in time, it's purely an abstraction. The fact is, he didn't. And the fact that he didn't requires no explanation whatsoever. It doesn't mean he's deeply flawed. It doesn't mean he's deeply uh, evil. It doesn't mean he harbors any hatred or distrust or lack of love for Leo. Only that he didn't. That's all it means. But what Leo, the master strategist, introduces into uh, Barney's head is this idea that, in, that, that this character, Barney, must have had poor motivation at best if he never uh, thought of it. Uh, and so, you know, this, this is the first idea that what I'm trying to introduce is that what Barney is experiencing here is a, uh, um, a translation and a kind of uh, infestation or infection that is at least as powerful, perhaps more powerful than anything Palmer Eldritch can ever introduce to him, which is the idea that there's something deeply wrong with him and that he is at fault. Now, in order for him to, for there to be anyone at fault, there has to be this kind of, uh, uh, you know, coherent entity called an I. Um, but if you recall, you know, Barney Marison, of course, is in this situation where he's carrying Dr. Smile around, a psychiatric suitcase, which is inducing him with many Freuds of stress in order to avoid the draft and in order to avoid going to Mars. So the idea that he is some sort of a coherent being who uh, is sufficiently static in order to be able to stay in one place long enough to be responsible for, you know, being the being who goes and saves Leo Bolero is an unbelievable fiction if we pause and sort of think about it. And so that what I wanted to do is put that next to number 389, which is still, let's see, it's chapter 11. No. Yeah, it's chapter 11. Um, and we see another instance of this, where in fact, this uh, infection of the ego, this infection of the eye happens to Leo himself. And this is uh, the second page, at least in this volume on, of chapter 11, but you should be able to find it fairly easily. Um, so we, we're returning to this, con uh, this uh, context of Barney not going to save Leo Bolero. He said, you're doing, Ronnie said, Ronnie Fugate, you're doing the same thing to him that he did to you. Who? What? Which we just might want to let stand there because sometimes we read very quickly when we read Philip K. Dick, but sometimes it's interesting to go very slowly and say, who, what, who, who did that actually? Barney was afraid to follow you when you disappeared on Luna. Now you're afraid. No, it's really very interesting. Was Barney afraid to follow Leo when he was on Luna? Or is there this sense that Barney simply made the calculation and did not follow him on Luna. There's a difference between fear and making the calculation. Barney was afraid to follow you when you disappeared on Luna. 
And the difference between fear and making the calculation is that it posits that there's an I there to have the fear. And I think if we look carefully at Barney's decision, quote unquote, to not follow Leo to Luna, which if I remember correctly, Ronnie Fugate was sort of involved in the deliberations concerning the character, then uh, it's not really a sense of, uh, of an I, right, that is making that decision, but really a set of uh, kind of logical premises that are making that decision, a set of algorithms that are making that decision. Said, it's, uh, Barney was afraid to follow you when you disappeared on Luna. Now you're afraid, and Leo corrects. He says, it's just not wise. All right, he said, I'm too goddamn scared of Palmer to set foot out outside this building. Of course, I'm not going to Mars. And what you say is absolutely true. So Barney corrects himself, and that's his internal monologue. He comes in and says, yes, you are afraid, right? The eye is saying, you're not just acting out of kind of algorithmic, almost machinic response, similar to the way in which the opening of Durandroid's Dream of Electric Sheep is a algorithmic, machinic response to even waking up in the day. You are afraid, right? There's something wrong with you that you're not responding to uh, Barney. And this is this kind of invention, this retroactive invention of an eye. And he says, it's just not wise. All right, I'm too goddamn scared of Palmer to set foot outside this building. Of course, I'm not going to Mars. And what you say is absolutely true. So he, Bar he, Leo's internal monologue has become convinced by this account. But no one, Ronnie said softly, is going to fire you the way you did Barney. And here's the interesting moment, I think. I'm firing myself inside. It hurts. But not enough to make you go to Mars. All right. Savagely, he snapped the vid set back on and dialed Felix Blau. Blau, I take it all back. I'm going myself, although it's insane. He cannot help himself, can he? He's at least infected as much by this idea that he is a responsible I, a responsible self, as he is by Chu Z. He's at least infected by that as much as Barney is by Chu Z. And so this idea, uh, it seems to me, that, that could occur to us as we're reading about novelists, novelists, inhabiting this world where they're uh, living through another character, whether that be the character of Perky Patton Walt or whether it be the character of Palmer Eldridge, right? There's only one character really in the world of Chu Z, then it might alert us to the fact that we're always living through this world of a character, right? That we're always, that our consciousness is always altered in some way, whether we're altering it with Candy or we're altering it with Chu Z or we're altering it with the Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch. And that the question we ought to be asking is, is this sense of, the, of ourselves as a character real, right? Or is it too as a character? Because at this moment, Felix Blau is saying, I'm firing myself inside, it hurts. He's watching himself beat up on himself, fire himself, right? As a kind of character, he's treating himself as a character. If he's firing himself, there's no other way for him to observe himself except for in an instance of ultra metacognition, right? He's watching himself fire himself and quote, but you're not enough to make you go to Mars. And then he's caught up in his own story, isn't he? As soon as Ronnie Fugate turns, uh, points it out, and perhaps she's already seen this in some kind of precognitive situation. As soon as she points it out, he can't avoid living up to the character in his story. And the character in his story is going to go and meet up with Barney. So that idea of uh, the infection of the eye and the role of ultra metacognition for putting us in a position to observe it is you know, very much something that uh, I wanted to point to today because it seems to me 
this is a script in here in the book or a kind of algorithm in the book for us to reflect on our own experiences of, is there really somebody there who is guilty of the things that they are guilty of? Or is it the case that like Barney Marison and like Leo Bolero, in fact, our guilt is the product of our treating us, of our forgetting that we are ourselves kind of fictional characters, that we're fictional characters that are a product of our own internal monologue. And when we fast forward and finally get to Vallis, we'll see that, you know, when PKD and Phil, who's also a character in Vallis, of course, treat uh, horse lover fat as an exercise in quote, much needed objectivity. It's a meditation on what happens when we begin to consider ourselves as characters in a novel and a novel, you know, not of our own writing, right? Of the writing of our own internal monologue of, of which we don't exercise control. And that, that uh, you know, experience, you know, might allow us to be free of the bondage to this character that we thought we were and to achieve what it is that Palmer Eldritch was trying to achieve, which is the substitution of himself for Barney, the, the killing off of his own old self and the metanoia or the being born again into who his new self is. So I hope that makes some sense. Uh, it's what happens to me when I, uh, uh, when I read, uh, when I read uh, Three Sigmata this time. So, might be a good time, Jeremy, to take a pause and for me to sip some tea and see if there are questions. All right. Yeah, there's been quite a few comments here. And um, let's see where we can get started. Uh, I love the comment section, guys. It's it's almost hard to, yeah, I know. Uh, to I, keep I, up I, with. I get a big screen that will like stream the comments while we're doing this, because otherwise I can barely see it. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, just, I think it's Trader Joe's green tea. It's not ayahuasca. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, yeah, this is, some people are just commenting on Palmer Eldritch himself as this being that's beyond the Proxers and the advanced metahumans. But, you know, we haven't really touched on that yet, but I think that this is also an interesting kind of mutability of identity in the, in the novel um, in the sense that it's very difficult to kind of see any causality, you know, the characters, there's precogs in this universe. Um, the choosy seems to be able to project a, a phantasm of oneself in a kind of astral etheric body into future potential realities, which will argue with the phantasm that they're the ones that are real and the phantasm is the ones that, that are from, are a ghost, you know? So there's a kind of relativity of, of time, of identity, of space, um, of self, and yes. this kind of, this kind of uh, surrender to, I mean, you're reading about the, the e-therapy especially, and there's this kind of, multi-directionality of it you could regress you could go back and even even barney's having trouble in his choosy experiences because he's getting pulled he's he may be evolving but his story is what he's latched onto right with, with emily and and his history and he just wants to escape back to that and he can't ultimately do it so his whole identity is getting shattered um and yet at the same time there's this kind of rushing forward of mutation right of of the future and of the big bobble-headed bubble heads um with the wispy bodies that kind of sound like grays for, in, in pop yes, i don't even know if those, those were around back in the 60s oh, they were yeah. around. <laughs> okay <laughs> so yeah i just i just find that interesting the the um the strange the strange becoming of the other the translation of of the self into the past, the future, uh, the the other alien is is Eldritch a prox, uh, Proxima, or is he something else? And I think the novel eventually goes to that point where it's like, no, 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 whatever he has become, it's this this other. So yeah, so there's this really interesting, unanswerable 
in-betweenness of, of, yes. of time, of self, of identity throughout the whole novel. And, it's and, just so, and that's so what we love. And, 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 and yet it's also coherent because, for example, this answers the question of why does nobody know what Barney's last name is? And, and the answer is because he's this incredibly, you know, vague identity, right? You remember in Scanner Darkly in the beginning, they'll, greet, they'll say, let's hear it for the vague blur, you know? And, and it's precisely his leakiness. The future leaks into Barney. Did we? Gift is not really to have an identity. Hey, folks, I think we just lost. <laughs> yeah, stream's cutting out. Oh, you're back. You know, who, who is this girl in my bed? Where am I? Is it close enough for me to not be late to work? Right. Uh, that this kind of, um, that his, his strength is the fact that he, he barely has an identity. And in, in barely having identity, we're invited into the place and those instances in our own lives where we observe that that's true of us as well, right? That, you know, we really are, you know, we're like, we're, we're not like our conscious awareness as a percentage of what we are is so minuscule that it becomes laughable at a certain point, right? So, you know, we wake up and we say, oh, you know, we actually pay attention and say, oh, I'm Rich or, oh, I'm Jeremy. Um, but really um, these in-between spaces that we're talking about where in fact time doesn't exist, right? Does, does linear time exist to your non-conscious mind? No, linear time is a, is a product of your conscious mind throwing narrative over the world and making sense of the world in the light of narrative. But that is such a teeny tiny little part of our own experience, right? You know, if you're like interested in the numbers, you can look at Gary Weber's blog and you can see that the non-conscious mind is capable of 25 million bits per second transmission and the conscious mind is capable of 60, okay? So that's 400,000 to one. So as soon as we look closely enough at our experience of time or our experience of identity, then we start to see that like, oh, you know, I can kind of put my hand through it. You know, it's, it's sort of a chooser, you know, it doesn't, it's not really here. You know, is, is time really flowing forward the way my narrative mind is telling me it is? Or am I a being of awareness who throws time over experience as a map by which I navigate the world? Same thing with identity. You say, oh, well, I certainly seem to have this experience of, you know, being Richard Matthew Doyle, born a Scorpio in Philadelphia, right? But the closer I look at that, I think, like, am I, is this really the same person that worked on the slime line in Alaska in 1987 and processed salmon at a rate, you know, of 130 a minute and was covered in fish guts all day? I mean, kind of, but, you know, I mean... Only to the same extent that orange is kind of like red. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's not, uh, you know, I, I, I see that it's not totally foreign to my experience, but it, the minute we'll drill down, as people say, onto identity and say, okay, well, which part of this life is me? And which part of this experience, even right now, is me? And we Rich, start. We're getting a little yeah. interference, just a little. Uh... It could be me. Well, it's a, it's a choosing. It could be me as well. Uh, but I'm just getting a little bit of a choppiness. I don't know if everybody else is getting um, that. I don't have anything else uh, running. Let's, let's see. see. Make sure. Um, Wi-Fi should be good. Yeah, it's cho choppy. Choppy. Sounds good here. Somebody says, yes, it's choppy. Okay, so maybe it's just a little hiccup somewhere along the pipes. Yeah. <laughs> um. But that makes sense, right? We give thanks for we get all praise entropy, 
Um, but I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, you know, that by portraying these characters that, as you rightly point out, Jeremy, you know, are sort of in this betweenness where timed, like our ordinary conceptions of time as linear don't really apply, right? And our ordinary conceptions of identity, as in I'm right here, Palmer Eldritch is over there, uh, don't really apply. Then it illuminates and highlights, you know, our own experience, our own queries of saying, well, am I really am I ident an identity? Do I really live in something like linear time, which can be incredibly liberating? to realize that in fact, time literally is a figment of our imagination, right? You know, that it is a mental map that we're not in a non-voluntary way, throwing over reality and living in as if it were real. But that anytime, if we'll focus on any particular moment, quote, and I use quotes there because there are no real moments, there's just now, then we see that, oh, this idea of before and after, or as you pointed out importantly earlier, causality is really just a useful, it, it's an often useful framework that we throw, that, that we're using on reality, but it is not reality. Reality itself is not causal. Rea reality is. We create causal stories in a desperate attempt to make sense of reality, but reality is so extraordinary and dynamic that those causal stories are never quite true. But in an evolutionary situation, they're better than not having them, right? So we die less often <laughs> when, when, when we have them, but they're not true. We're, we're somehow persuaded by the fact that they don't kill us, that they're somehow true. Same with identity and time. Time is useful for making sure that the plane is at the gate when I show up, right? But in terms of it being an actual attribute of reality, you know, the physicists say interesting things about it. It's like, well, no, there's really only the present. And the present is a singularity unfolding. And that singularity unfolding has this characteristic in our awareness, in our consciousness, sometimes as unfolding in linear time, but that's a evolutionary biological attribute that we use. And it's not a characteristic of reality, if that makes sense. Any more than red is a characteristic of reality. You know, things aren't mm. red. <laughs> yeah, just to interject very quickly with uh, Tessa was mentioning see if I can find it, uh, that Eldritch is a word used by um, uh, Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft. And, yep. this, and, and in many ways, Eldritch, Palmer Eldritch, or whatever he is or becomes, is very reminiscent of like the old gods, right? This sort of yes. being that invades. I mean, it's a very kind of Cthulian yes. novel in the terms of what kind of alien it is and how it's invading reality. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a great... A connection there i think well, maybe I, that was even I, it would be interesting to ask tessa uh what you know what was pkd's uh reading of lovecraft like did he did he do a lot of reading of lovecraft what was the uh i th think lovecraft comes up a few times in the exegesis but and obviously eldritch is you know resonant with that but was there was he a fan basically she's saying he read some lovecraft stories yeah so, and what he knew that? about the Cthulhu. Yeah. Um, so. And, and I, you know, that would be an interesting webinar to do, Lovecraft, because, you know, there's, there, there's something more similar than a name there in Lovecraft, because that same kind of sense of uh, dark trance that you can fall into with PKD. But what I find interesting towards the end of the Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch is this kind of uh, almost empathy that uh, it ha it is there for Palmer Eldritch that, you know, just a life form trying to propagate itself, you know? And uh, 
you know, you can almost imagine, you know, Palmer Eldridge, it's, it's a little too early for the keep on trucking, you know, T-shirt or buttons, which were happening then, you know, but it's just like, hey, I'm just keeping on keeping on here, right? I'm just doing what I have to do to be. Um, so th- that sense of the, the, the darkness and the sort of ancient ineffable quality of the Eldritch um, is also buffered by a compassion and even a reverence for, you know, those ancient ones. That it's not simply, you know, as we like, because we're, we're on the other side of Christianity, where those ancient ones are understood as being, you know, kind of dark, and, you know, not the way. Um, But in fact, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're potent, mythic, archetypical structures in their own right, that, you know, depending on our temperament, may be great teachers for us. Um, and I think it was a teacher for, you know, it feels like reading Three Stigmata and Palmer Eldridge, Palmer Eldridge was a teacher for PKD because when he shows that compassion, even just through one of his characters for Eldridge, I think it's a really beautiful thing because it would be very easy and it, it would be a temptation for a novelist at that point to sort of demonize Eldridge, you know, and make us feel, oh, they're all contaminated. You know, we're all contaminated. Original sin, help, <laughs> you know. But in fact, it's like, hey, actually, it's a little bit like maybe when you first learn that you're 10% by dry weight human and the rest of it is bacterial. It's like, oh, <laughs> I'm mostly not me, <laughs> you know. Uh, I'm a host for all these others. It's like, oh, but hey, isn't that beautiful, actually, right? That you can be interconnected with the ancient ones is itself really the gift, right? And I know the gift means poison in this novel, but poison is a matter of dosage, you know? And so if we can feel that, like, wow, yes, we are still connected uh, to these kind of ancient mythic structures. And, you know, we're not always aware of the way they're working through us. And we're not always aware, you know, and, and that, you know, a, a novel like Three Tugmata kind of helps bring it into relief for us. You know, I think it's a beautiful thing. That, that's it, you know, I, I you know, the, the comment of last, no, week, two weeks ago about Jung and Freud, I think it's there. I mean, I, I think it's a very interesting parallel reading to do with PKD, which is to read Jung's Red Book. Um, or to just kind of browse Jung's Red Book because it encourages this, is this kind of um, tarrying with the shadow, you know, working with the darkness and working with the, the, the old ones in a way uh, that we might be otherwise frightened from, frightened, frightened with. So, um, good power. Tessa's saying, yeah, Phil Drew. Yeah much info from Jung and that's fascinating Tessa I would love to hear more about that in terms of um, what he was reading perhaps what was available at that time what what kind of drew him into Jung I can't imagine he wouldn't because of the the Gnosticism right Um, but even this even uh, Eldritch is kind of a Gnostic being too right just in terms of his and you kind of, I mean, I know the Gnostics are like, okay, these are fake gods. It's not the real God, but there's also a kind of, in some areas, a, a sympathy because like, it's just an idiot. It's just some guy. It's just some guy who's a little bit higher up on the, like on the Lucifer. ontological ladder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, you know, have sympathy with him too. He's, he's like us. He's just another organism just on a grander scale. Yes, right. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, no, no stress, Tessa. I'm just, you know, just throwing that out there. Whatever you, uh, whatever you want to share, oh, uh, whatever. Comes I wanted to, to mention, mind. of course, too, is there, there's the beautiful introduction to the I Ching that Carl Jung wrote for the uh, Richard Wilhelm translation, where he asks the I Ching what he should write about the I Ching, which is a kind of ultra metacognition of its own sort, right? Um, in, in Jung's hands. So yeah, no, I, the, the parallels 
Jung, PKD are beautiful. And, yeah. and Red Book is the companion volume to the exegesis, I would say. Gosh, yeah, I'm, I, I know you mentioned that before, and I, it's really a quite a parallel that I hadn't thought of before. And it's interesting. Within a few years of the of each yes. other, they yes. both came out into our our culture and our consciousness. I think the out red the book was pop. like, yeah, oh nine or so, and then uh, Exegesis was when was 11. it? 2011. 11. 11? Yeah. yeah. So just a few years between each other. Uh, Tess is mentioning about uh jung that philip k dick was interested in his writing uh in, in the anima and the shadow that was kind of his focus yes. in, in reading jung yeah hmm. you can feel that yeah uh, Lindsay's mentioning this too on on, on our point that orobindo gives compassion for evil too by showing how happy they are to give up their centuries long ruse interesting yes the asuric beings uh Right, exactly. I mean, it's all part of the one. So the problem with darkness is not that it's dark, but is that we perceive it as somehow the opposite of light. Oh, Tess is also saying that Phil had the Wilhelm Baines translation of the I Ching and loved Young's uh, intro as well. So, okay. Yeah, he was right, right in with Bain all of this too. Up as the title of a character in Man in the High Castle. It is the name of a character is Bing. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Which of course was written with the I Ching. So beautiful. We just closed the loop. Yeah. <laughs> oh my. Okay. Um, so let's see. Is there any other comments here about poison is a matter of dosage, as yes. Don is quoting. And then Tom is mentioning Paracelsus, who maybe said exactly who that's from. Said that. Yeah fascinating alchemical reference that pkd may have likely gotten given our previous comments from tessa from jung because jung is looking closely at paracelsus and mike is uh, asking are we all already yes. palmer eldritch <laughs> <laughs> well we're all already beyond palmer eldritch actually you know like our, our ability to be inhabited by palmer eldritch shows that we're all already ballast really uh, that we're all already one being and that to the extent that we insist on constantly experiencing a higher power as a being other than ourselves then we're going to project it as some avatar such as Eldritch but in fact it's us <laughs> trying to catch up with the comments here this is good stuff uh in Exegesis, Piketty writes that the three, a three stigmata vision of God were the beginnings of the uh, 2374 event. And Interesting. I, yeah, I believe he saw Eldritch in the sky uh, at um, Point Reyes. Um, again, Tessa might be able to confirm or deny there. Yeah. And uh, so again and i think it's really interesting I and mean, maybe this is a point to bring up something uh that, that that i've wanted to bring up because today i read I, I taught a book from the 15th century the book of marjorie kemp uh, some of you may know it it's the first autobiography in english and it was written by a woman in the 15th century which is already remarkable um and uh she, incredible life she ends up going to jerusalem on an ass and you know, traveling by boat to Italy and going to Rome. And she's having these intense visions. And her manuscript wasn't uh, uh, discovered until 1934. And uh, thank you for posting that, Mike. And, uh, and it's really interesting to look at the how the scholars respond to Marjorie Kemp because they need to publish it because it's the first autobiography in English and it's by a woman, but they don't, they, they're trying to keep their distance on what they call her madness, which of course is an ahistorical category. Madness was not anything that any of uh, um, Marjorie Kemp's contemporaries diagnosed her with, right? They, 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 they thought, some of them thought she might be, you know, diabolical, but none of them thought that she was, you know, mad. So uh, I, I think what's interesting uh, that PKD introduces us to is 
the enormous constriction, it's almost like the, uh, you, you know, the enclosure that happened, you know, in England when they built fences and we started to have private property. Uh, yes, yeah, she could weep like no one's business. She would cry aloud. She was not in control. She had these incredible visions. And, but the distance that we want to take on those visions and the ascription of those visions to madness is so unjust, not only to her experience, but to the sheer bandwidth of our own minds that we're capable of all these forms of consciousness and to sort of label them as madness and to diagnose them in this way is, first of all, you know, there, there's even, a, I believe it's the APA stricture, it's the Goldberg uh, or the Goldwater uh, memo against diagnosing anyone without having met them. That, you know, when we look back at the New York Times review by Charles Platt of the exegesis, and when we look at what scholars do for the most part with PKD's work, it's, it's, it's rampant with diagnoses, you know, that, that instead of accepting and hosting these worlds that he's brought into being, these visions, and not judging them, and not saying, are they true, are they false, just what is it like to inhabit them, that as with Marjorie Kemp, we want to sort of, you know, put them in some sort of a category, and that's very interesting to me, indeed, that we become so uncomfortable with a fiction writer that who's able to introduce us to worlds because he's a brilliant fric fiction writer. That's what a fiction writer is. Somebody who throws worlds into our head that we can inhabit and participate in. But we're, we're comfortable with them when they're in books that are clearly labeled novels and so forth. But if it's in the exegesis, then we become very uncomfortable because we say, oh my gosh, you know, like he thinks this real. You know, it's like, no, it's because he doesn't think any of this is real, <laughs> right? And, and, and that he's, he's keying into the fact that we're these programmable and therefore reprogrammable, you know, uh, biocomputers, living systems, human beings that don't need to live in thrall with either Buster Friendly or Mercer, <laughs> Right, that there's n channels that we can occupy here. So, um, you know, this uh, this refusal to allow for visionary experience, I think, uh, is something worth noting here, and noting that where it's allowable in PKD's work, what's acceptable in PKD's work in terms of mainstream culture and the scholars. And then what is not, and I can tell you there's a very interesting scholarly collection to which I contributed, and it's called The World According to Philip K. Dick. And, you know, in it, it it's, it's rampant, with, and I guess this is just what academics do, but it's rampant with kind of diagnosis and abstraction. And uh, the, the diagnosis, you know, it's, it's an act of hostility. Uh, you know, what I would say is don't knock it till you try it. <laughs> you know, like, if you, you know, give the exegesis a try, you might find it interesting. Um, it's not mad to, uh, as it, it gets put at one point, to experience the, con in Dallas, to experience the contents of your own mind. Like, at one point, you know, Fat basically comes to the conclusion that he had experienced in the Dallas experiences nothing but the contents of his own mind. Well, if that's all it is, it's still extraordinary, right? Is that what our minds are? This ability to experience this unity with the cosmos, this ability to experience this, you know, radical interconnection with all beings based on our informational attributes. Wow, let's try it. Maybe it's a better game than killing our neighbor, to paraphrase, uh, uh, you know, John Lilly. Maybe it's a better game than killing our neighbor because they don't agree with our dualistic conception of reality. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this webinar, because I really wanted to speak up for PKD's epistemology, his ontology, his metaphysics, not because there's some spiritual tradition that I think we should align with, but because he's pointing to the falsehood of the present. He's pointing, pointing to the fact that this isn't real. 
And that's the opposite of mad. To be a prophet and to point out that this is false, what we're all investing in. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike shared the book, World According to BKD, in the chat. Oh, good. And, oh, how um, do you do that? That's pretty cool. I love the interwebs. I mean, <laughs> like the whole PDF? Just, no, no, there's oh. still a link to oh. the book, I think, where nice you can buy it. PDF. That would be nice. Um, but perhaps somebody could share that link as well. Uh, yeah. I'm sure the link is out there. Yeah. So, yeah, just a lot of people are, are chiming in about that and how important it is. And I think it's interesting the proximity of certain individuals uh, like Philip K. Dick in our culture, where there's only a few degree, you could, you could get into Blade Runner, you could get into the pop culture, you could even, you know, from a secular point of view, start to read a little bit about PKD and philosophy, but there's only a few degrees separation between that and then, oh, Vallis was kind of autobiographical. Oh, oh, yeah. Let me check out the eggs of Jesus. So there's a kind of proximity to, to this sort of irrational world space, a reality space, or what, uh, what Baruch calls alterations of consciousness, mm -hmm. that uh, there's a kind of corrosiveness in, in these things sort of invading popular culture. And I like that about Philip Kiddick and, and other writers. And Jeffrey Kripal kind of gets into that too, how, you know, more more authors and artists and writers who are responsible for our culture and our pop culture have these kind of brushes with religious experience, hallucination, synchronicity, and the paranormal, like these kinds of things that we don't want reality to be are actually very integral to what we, what we assume, you know, are, is our kind of mundane reality through science fiction and so on. So, but that's what yeah. makes it so interesting, right. To then compare what we can have access to. And this is, remember, where we began last time with Joanne Andrews doing Electric Sheep, what the kernel, what the message is of the texts versus then how the text gets translated into a kind of branded PKD object, right? So I, I saw the first episode of uh, uh, the Electric Dreams of PKD, and there's this kind of Phil Dickian branding that's happening which has nothing to do with the non-dual characteristics right it has everything to do with this kind of technophilia technophobia kind of twin-headed monster you know that uh you know we're, we're, we're meant to inhabit so i mean i think it's really interesting that on the one hand pkd is so extraordinarily present in our culture in, in a way that i'm sure uh, although, you know, maybe Tessa will correct, but probably would boggle his mind that he was such a presence in our culture and was such, in fact, a prophet of and seen as such a prophet of our culture. And at the same time, the, you know, uh, um, the, the pushing away of the metaphysical aspect of the, the visionary aspect of what he's doing. Um, you know, just as, you know, it made people very uncomfortable to learn, say, that Steve Jobs took more LSD during a certain period of the 1970s than Timothy Leary, right? You know, and that every year he read Richard Maurice Buck's book, Cosmic Consciousness, which would be an interesting book to read alongside Vallis, which describes Vallis experiences had by different individuals through history, or that he read every year. The other book he read every year was Yogananda's autobiography of a yogi, right? That, that, you know, the very architect or one of the architects of the sort of, you know, infosphere by which we're, you know, participating right now was themselves, you know, influenced by this visionary imaginal realm. Um, and so I think watching as institutional culture, that's what I'll call it rather than mainstream culture, institutional culture tries to both have its cake and eat it too, right? Tries to, you know, take the fruits of that visionary culture and then deny its sources. I think it's something for us to be aware of, not out of a sense of justice or of resentment or revenge, but just to know that that's where really, that's where ideas come from. It's not an accident because that's where ideas come from. Ideas come from this visionary realm. 
So when PKD is tuning into Jung, Jung is tuning into a visionary realm. PKD is tuning into a visionary realm. And that, that is um, something that we're actively blocking, actually, as a culture. And that when people diagnose Marjorie Kemp, when they diagnose PKD, what they're really afraid of are ideas. <laughs> and what they're really afraid of is thinking. And that, but when we engage in these radical acts of reading together, we're doing that, in fact. And it's, it's very interesting to observe that it actually has an effect. And it doesn't just have an effect in our own kind of exchanges, but just doing that you know, over the course of a week, entering into that trance seems to do something. Let me give you an example, uh, an analogy. Um, for some years here on the campus where I teach, we had a flotation tank lab. And um, it was incredible synchronicity by which we got access to a flotation tank, but we had one. And um, yes, yeah, Savitri, oh, it's, it's, it's so beautiful. We should, we should all read that to get together someday. I mean, as a as an incantory, you know, it's incantation. It's it takes you places that are just extraordinary. But um, you know, if we if we when we do all that together, it's a little bit like when I had on campus this flotation tank lab, where we had about a hundred people cycling through this flotation tank all the time. So they were you know taking the people would float, and you would sort of see people around campus, and you could see them the the mark, the spore was always, there was a little bit of Epsom salts that was left around their ears that they hadn't gotten quite washed off after floating. And just their presence on the campus of a hundred people regularly accessing just no thoughts, right? An altered state of consciousness that harbored no ill will towards anyone and didn't think that it knew who they were. Right, you know, they, they're just no thoughts, thought of unknowing. It had a real effect on the kind of barometric pressure of the noosphere of the campus. I even think Lindsay might have been on the campus at that time, actually, even though we didn't know each other at that time. Um, so I, I think that when we do all of this together, you know, I'm just maybe asking everyone to sort of observe, can you, can you see any effects of this collective translation that we're doing out there in the world? And, you know, don't grasp after it. Oh, <laughs> I think so, but LSD was your, yeah, well, you didn't have access to the flotation tank. Um, well, you know, there's no necessary opposition between the two, okay? Like, the flotation tank was invented in order to study LSD, so... You know, no problem there. Um, so anyway, it looks like it's 916. So maybe get to some last questions and then, uh, you know, chew some fibrous. <laughs> <laughs> Grab some fungal, cheesy some or lichen, candy. Get some lichen into ourselves and let some drool roll, roll out of the corner of our mouths. and. <laughs> um. Ubik for next week. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what we had planned. Yeah, we were switching. Agree. Um, we agree. Tess. Tess. Yeah. Don't need LSD. I'm, I'm already weird. Yeah. That's how I feel. Um, yeah, what was, was the book you mentioned? Sorry. Yes. Uh, what was the book you mentioned about? For the knuckleheads like ourselves that can't get it on the, uh, you know, on the natural. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what was that book about uh, the Vallis experiences yeah. through the ages? Yeah, okay, so Richard Maurice Buck, Cosmic Consciousness. It was written in the 19th century. Oh, okay. he, was, he was literally a disciple of Walt Whitman, and it's available for free online. Uh, and Franklin Merrill Wolf mentions it. And then intriguingly, Yogananda also mentions it. And then, so the other book is Autobiography of a Yogi by Yogananda who was responsible for bringing some of the yoga to California in the early 20th century. Um, and they're both available for free online. And apparently Steve Jobs read every, both of them every year, um, which, you know, isn't necessary. In particular, I would say uh, Cosmic Consciousness is a remarkable book because it looks at a lot of historical figures like Spinoza 
or Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walt Whitman, and says, you know, hey, you know, leaves out Julian of Norwich, leaves out St. Teresa, says, hey, maybe this is a thing. Maybe this is an evolutionary phenomenon that we're like what we're calling ultra metacognition here is essentially cosmic consciousness in Buck. And he himself experienced it while reading some uh, of the British romantic poets out loud and had this experience, had a kind of metanoia experience, had a kind of vowels experience. Uh, and there you go. And um, it's a beautiful book and it's available for free. And he was Canadian and uh, ran an asylum in Canada, but was a kind of devotee uh, of Whitman and wrote a, also a very remarkable book on Walt Whitman. And again, if you put Song of Myself, uh, which is a subset of Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman, and you put it next to portions of the exegesis, there's a lot of resonance there, right? I mean, that th this this idea that that PKD is some kind of a like anomaly is far from the case. That there is a strand of you know not only American you know, global literature, but also even within American literature, you have a strand of awakening beings, you know Whitman, Thoreau, Emerson. You know, PKD, uh, Burroughs, Joanna Rose, many others, many others. That that in fact that it's not a rare thing, and that it's only when we package literature and we package philosophy and say, oh, it's about this, rather than this is a way of transmitting an experience of your dissolution of self, <laughs> which is really what it is. Um, but we're beginning to lose touch with that a little bit. Um, and so one of the reasons I'm so happy to participate in this is that we might be able to repotentiate some of it and realize like, what are, like, like it may be that reading a book in a week is at least as much of a kind of, you know, spiritual transformation, you know, as taking a tab of LSD now in this historical moment. Gosh, yeah. I mean, you and I were talking about that recently about how Philip K. Dick himself is a kind of literary psychoactive, and yes. and that literature is a kind of psycho psychedelic pharmacology, right? Yeah, that alters our consciousness and, and sure. puts us into these trance states. So, to to direct our attention so contemplatively with Philip K. Dick. Yes. That has everything packed in here, right? All of the things we're talking about, ultramatic cognition, the dissolution of, of, of separate self-identity and empathy and cosmic consciousness. Just stay focused on and that. God. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, you know, he, he's, I mean, and he's so relentless, you know, and unsparing. He doesn't let us shirk the questions um, where we're, we're going to try to, right? We're going to try to find some character to root for, some character to root against, right? We're going to try to turn it into a dualism. And by the end, we just can't. We have to see that it's just this all one unfolding system that is nested inside of itself. And maybe that's where we live as well. Yeah, especially in this book and just any of his books. Uh, again, the, the sympathetic nature of, of Philip K. Dick's writing kind of it 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 disarms you you know if you're if you're an atheist is maybe not for everybody for but for me like the the christian theological questions around god you know he makes me kind of go oh you're right we do need to think about original sin we do need to think about redemption i feel you there you know i feel yeah. him there in the writing exactly. um so but yeah you're absolutely right um gosh i, I really found just as like a quick note uh an interesting i don't know it's towards the end of the book about they're talking about this curse of eldritch right is it a yeah. curse is it a kind of a new original sin um he's talking about yeah all three stigmata the artificial yeah. hand the eyes and the jaw symbols of inhabitation and then um they go on to say it you know that this is sort of yeah we don't have any sacraments no mediation to protect ourselves uh it's just out in the Good. open ranging in every direction yay <laughs> but that's so reminded me of tayhard and his yeah. whole when he's out in China, right, and he's doing the dig, the paleontology dig, and he doesn't have the host, he doesn't have the bread and, and the, the body and the blood of Christ, so he consecrates the, 
a mass on the world, right? The, the whole yeah. thing. The hymn of the universe. Um, yeah, hymn of the universe, a sacramental imagination. So it's just you no, can't no. you slip into these questions with reading. And, and, and you reading. can't and, and what's interesting is that good. You know, maybe we were keeping it bay with the sacraments, right? You know, maybe the rituals is keeping it separate from us. Maybe the problem is not that we can't escape Eldridge, but that we think there's an I here that could escape in the first place, right? That, that, that there is no uh, 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 separation between ourselves and the divine. And that, you know, we need to be with that. Uh, and, and, and PKD gives us a little bit of a taste of what it's like to be with that. Um, yes, the sacraments are like the layout. Exactly. Uh, we don't need the layout anymore. Um, you know, fine. If you like the layout, use the layout. Um, but but I, I agree with you. Now, for the longest time, first 20 years that I read PKD probably, we, you know, I would get to the Christian parts and I would go, oh, blah, 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 blah. You know, just like, <laughs> not going not gonna to listen to that part. Not, not going to hear it, which, of course, is a very, you know, I just wasn't ready. And it's not that, therefore, I become a Christian, but it's saying, like, I welcome, as you point, it, point out, the form of the kind of ontological existential questions that he's asking us to ask ourselves. And he's asking with us. He's saying, wow, what would it be like to be a hovelist on Mars and, you know, not be able to get the Eucharist more than every two weeks, right? And, you know, would you be tempted by this apparently artificial Eucharist? And of course, there he's deeply resonating with the debate debates of the time that are happening around psilocybin and LSD because people are saying, you know, can you have, you know, this artificial sacrament to the divine? Well, of course, psilocybin is not artificial, but, you know, somebody like Houston Smith will answer quite definitively, there's nothing artificial about them, right? They're all part of the one. And, you know, he'll, he'll you know, in Cleansing the Doors of Perception, his remarkable book, he just passed a few years ago. He says, hey, you know, I was like one of the, he was one of the top uh, religious historians in the world, if not the top. And he says, all this stuff I've read about I felt like I was finally able to experience it when I engaged in these experiments with psychedelics. So uh, that's not a touting of psychedelics, but to say that, uh, you know, this experience is available to us and it's available to us in many different ways. And that the non, you know, if, if PKD said reality, which is, is that which stops, go, uh, uh, doesn't go away just because we stop believing in it that we need to engage in different practices in order to uh, experience that unchanging characteristic of reality. And that sometimes when we experience it as unchanging, we say, wow, that's, that's the ancient one because it feels old, but that's like our temporal treatment of it. But in fact, it's not old. It's just timeless. <laughs> it's, it, it doesn't change at all. But from our perspective, it seems very old because that's the best, kind of point of view that we can have on something that is eternally there if that makes sense mm. uh, i don't mm. i don't think pkd ever met out of suxley we can ask uh, tessa yeah that's a good question as well um and thanks mike for tonight just for the All super links. awesome linking everything just like bringing in the relevant stuff in the chat and i'm saving the chat again so <laughs> link, everybody will get that again oh he turned down a chance to meet Oh man. That's but that way we can talk about it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does yeah, Tessa and have on, an answer, like what why 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 did he turn it down? It's kind of interesting. Yeah. We gotta just have, have Tessa on with us. Yes, we have maybe we... Uh, oh he... Aldous. Oh 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 he wanted to meet Julian. Oh, <laughs> oh. oh Julian was a great mind. <laughs> Wow. Um, yeah, he wrote the forward to to yeah uh, are. phenomenon event. Yeah, yes, exactly. The old the old copy. Yeah. Also wrote some interesting pieces on psychedelics in the psychedelic review. Um. Oh, that's so interesting. 
because I've always had more sympathy with Julian than Aldous. <laughs> I mean, I love Aldous. Don't get me wrong. But you're like, why does anybody know about Julian? That's so interesting. So yeah, like, let's um, get Tessa on with the Zoom. With the Zoom. Yeah, Tessa, we we should probably talk about that. I think it would be great just as we wrap up now. Um, we've got we've got a few more weeks, and I think during that time or perhaps after that time, we can have some some bonus tapes. You'd be welcome to join us. Um, and we could also probably do, I, I saw Jen, um, my good friend, uh, who's also who's going to be to- co-teaching a class with me on Area X and the Southern Reach Trilogy, speaking of literature uh-huh. and books uh, on Nura. But she's also mentioning that we should do a PKD and Red Book class. I think that would uh-huh. be a great exploration. Maybe not a full class, but at least a session I, I together. Know, I know a great person to do the young side. Oh, awesome. And it happens to be the granddaughter of Franklin Merrill Wolf. Oh. Yeah. Dorothy Leonard. Uh, i write that down. A Jungian psychoanalyst. Wonderful person. And, uh, Excellent. She, she may or may not be interested, but she would be mm-hmm. good. On, I know she studies the Red Book intensely. So, um, Good. Suddenly it's 9.30. Yeah, we're we're already there. Okay, we're oh, talking um, time. Yep. So next week uh, we read Ubik. we read Ubik this week. Yep. Yeah. Um, what else? Uh, as usual, the recording will go out probably tomorrow evening. And thanks everybody for tuning in once again. Thanks Tessa for all of your your support and your generosity and being here and giving us some fascinating um, biographical aspects that really enrich the conversation yeah, here the whole thing and is uh, everybody's talk questions to Lindsay. talk to Lindsay about for the pamphlet yes right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're gonna talk with uh with you Lindsay, and uh I'll, I'll message you after this we're building just as a quick note um quick notes for going forward since we're live streaming too so tomorrow night we actually have a paid class on sound and esotericism with uh, uh, Al- uh, Alexander Tanu. I definitely recommend that. That's a really great deep dive. And uh, Tanu is, is a busy guy and we love to have him on when he can come on. So definitely check that out. And um, that's the main thing. <laughs> so I just wanted to bring that up. But yeah, thank you everybody. And uh, see you next week. And uh, see you, oh, that's what I was gonna bring up. We've got a Facebook group now and I'm gonna post it in the chat box oh, here. I, I created a, I caved in, I caved in, I created a, a Facebook group um, for this class particularly. We've got about 18 members so far and I'm, let me just find a link to it. If somebody can beat me to it, then good. But here we go. In the chat and I'll post it on Facebook as well. That's our group. So feel free to join us and share your experiences and Lindsay will talk after about getting your your comics into the neurological. There's gonna be a zine that goes along with this uh, that we're working with Revelor Press on. Um, and Rich is gonna be contributing pieces to it. We're gonna think about art. So this is a great direction and uh, we'll definitely send that to you guys when it, when it starts developing and materializing. So yeah, this class is invading, invading uh, exactly. the, the literary world uh, very shortly. It's so. growing faster than Eldritch. <laughs> yeah. And you can all partake in, in a translation with the text. So, <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Well, have, a, have a great night, Rich. We'll see you next week. Yay. Take care. Bye, everybody.